Hello. Hi. Good day. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you. Great. I can hear you very nicely as well. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi, we can hear you. Um, super, super. Sorry, I thought that these sessions weren't open, so I'm just quickly... Okay, so JD's here. I just need to tell the other panelists that it's working. But everybody has their um, video working and they've used Zoom before. Yes. Okay, super. Um, and then uh, Prof. Daramola, um, you will be talking first um, and you will be providing an overview based on your, your research that led to the conversation article or based on any research that you've done about um, where uh, e-government services are happening and what are the challenges. JD, you'll be talking as your experience um, as a developer and working with uh, government as clients and partners um, and reflecting on, I'm guessing, Buga Mali, is that okay? Buleka Mali, sure, yes. Buleka Mali, sorry, Buleka Mali, um, wake up money, not... Um, <laughs> oh, oh, it's open, open money. money. Yeah. <laughs> okay, super. Um, and you'll be introduced as, as, um, as from uh, Open Up, um, as the senior developer. Yeah. Okay, and Prof Daramola is Prof Daramola. Um, so unless we have any questions, I'm just gonna uh, turn off my screen, freshen up, get a piece of paper um, and just uh, let the other participants know. So you'll be speaking uh, five to six minutes each, uh, seven would be your max, but I think we're gonna have one round of, of your, um, your, your talking to your subject matter and then we will be collecting questions uh, from the audience or either from me as a moderator. Okay, that's fine. Okay, super. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Nice to meet you, Professor Daramola. Yeah, nice to meet you, JD. Thanks. I hope this is useful for your research, Daramola, and um, for everyone's experience here. Um, and I hope you're also able to attend some of the other sessions. So I'll be back with you in um, 10 minutes just to check up. Okay, that's fine.
Hello, I believe we've had someone join. Um, welcome, Jean Hong. Um, I believe you may, might be a um, attendee. Um, and then uh, I would just like to confirm with the host um, that um, everybody is uh, that or everybody who's joined has the ability to speak. So. Um, yeah, uh, Professor Daramola, you can speak, um, and JD, you can speak. Um, I managed to be added as a co-host. Okay, super. Senka, hello, how are you? Testing. Hi, Alex. Hi. So I was just testing, everybody can speak at the moment, um, Felicia and, um, uh, Mr. Snail are going to be coming a bit late anyway, so might miss the sound check. Um, I see that um, JD is a host and um, Senka is not, but um, I'm a co-host. Um, as the rapporteur, I think that should be okay for you, Senka, hey? Uh, I guess. Okay. Uh, yeah, excuse me. I'm not sure if I'm uh, having the right link. I'm not the speaker, just the, the normal participant. I, I, am I supposed to click this Zoom link rather than uh, going to see the video stream? Oh, you, you do have the right link. You're just early. So <laughs> you get to, oh, okay, okay. Get to meet us for the sound check. But thanks for being on. Um, this, this helps anyway. Um, Obviously, you should uh, mute yourself when the session starts, but um, yeah, we look forward to your inputs and you'll be able to ask questions during the second round uh, uh, in the second half hour of the session. Um, how do we pronounce your name, Jian Hong? Uh, yeah, Xian, yeah, very well done, Xian Hong. <laughs> yeah, you are a genius. <laughs> and you're joining us from? Uh, uh, from Paris, UNESCO headquarter. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, we are supporting the African IGF, and now that we are having a session, so we are very interested to, to yeah, to work, yeah, to look around and to see uh, interesting topics like in your session. Okay, super. Um, and then everybody, if you can't find your headphones like me, then just remember to mute yourself. But you can hear me fine. I'm not doing any feedback or anything. Okay. Sound good. Alex, um, the recording, uh, are you the one recording or? Oh, it's already recording. It's, um, it's an automatic recording. It's going to uh, be stored in the cloud, so we'll share okay. it. No, I'm, I'm just wondering, will it be shared with uh, all of us? Oh. Exactly. It's going to be on the Africa IGF website. Okay. Will it be on YouTube? Uh, we're going to put a link on YouTube and the link on the website. Yes. Okay, super. <laughs> Super. Um, then, um, yeah, we'll still wrap it here, but maybe we can feed it through an AI afterwards. That's awesome. Um, Senka, you got the notes on how to wrap it here, hey? And the, the form. Yeah, I got the uh, template two days okay, ago. Super. Yeah. I realized uh, it's kind of, it has to be very brief, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I make a mistake by doing quite complex notes for rapporteuring and then one does need to, like the, the key messages, um, but I'll take notes as well, we can compare them. Okay. I'll I also realize that we, we do not have a, a online moderator, but I guess that's fine. Uh, yeah, so I think we'll have to take questions from the audience. Um, there is a feature in Zoom to put your hand up or I guess just to ask questions in the chat. Um, yeah. So, and then um, I was going to say, do you have some questions on Twitter? But um, I guess we should take questions from the people in the room. Um, you register, but yeah. So the, um, 
I am acting as a moderator, so I believe I can mute people um, okay. and uh, yeah, exercise the the, <laughs> the censorship. No, the, the 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 reason I'm asking is also because the reporting form um, has that field online moderator. <laughs> Ah, okay. That, that, um, I guess if I just put your or my name, it's uh, it's fine. Yeah, you could put us both as online moderators. All um, right. So you'll look for questions and I'll relay them. I guess it's a um, coming from the the IGF, the international IGF, where mm. the online moderators are the people who operate WebEx. Um, but yeah, an online moderator is a moderator in 2020. <laughs> I'll see you all in nine minutes. Yep. Hi, Felicia. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Yeah, we already did a bit of a, a sound and video check a few minutes ago and decided to, yeah, <laughs> rejoin just one minute before 9 a.m. Okay. Yeah, I got um, Alexis' email and um, the host just... Thanks for joining us. Hi, Felicia. How are you doing? I love you. Hi. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I, your sound seems to be working and everything. Um, so then the only thing I didn't clarify is, is we will be um, asked one question about your area of expertise. And then you'll speak for five minutes. And then we'll take questions from the audience and have a discussion. Okay, sounds perfect.
Uh, the last thing is I'm going to tweet or retweet this session. Um, and if any of the speakers have Twitter handles um, that they would like to share, uh, maybe they can add them in the chat. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the session. Can you all hear me? Yes. Super. Super. So today we have, uh, as our panelists, we're talking about clogs and bottlenecks to e-government services in Africa. 
we have our panelists. Uh, first, Professor Olawande Daramole from the Cape University of Technology. Uh, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Olawande Daramole has done research on e-government services in Africa. And there's a piece this year in the conversation um, that, that he has uh, summarized his research on. Um, second, we have uh, JD Botmar, and uh, JD is a senior developer from he's a senior developer from Open Up, an NGO in South Africa that um, uses civil tech to uh, enhance uh, uh, yeah, democracy, accountability, transparency, and, and uh, obviously government services in South Africa. Um, then we have Felicia Antonio. Felicia is from Access Now, and she works on their Keep It On campaign. And the Keep It On campaign is with, with regards to um, internet shutdowns in Africa, which has unfortunately been quite a trend in the past few years. And um, shutdowns of and access to the internet are obviously very important to the delivery of government services. Um, lastly, and uh, he may be joining us a bit late, we have um, oh, Siswe Snail is here. Siswe Snail is a um, lawyer uh, focusing on, on, on uh, technology law, privacy and security uh, with Snail attorneys. Siswe is also, although he'll be speaking in his uh, personal capacity, he's a part-time member of the South African Information Regulator. So he'll be speaking about um, privacy security and e-government services. So if we can start uh, with Professor Daramola, um, and we all have um, five minutes, uh, if we could start with Professor Daramola, could you give us an overview of, of e-government services in Africa? What are the flagship pro projects? Uh, where is it happening? And what are the key challenges? Okay, thank you so much. And um, I want to say good day to everyone. Um, talking about e-government in Africa, over the years, the diffusion of e-government in Africa has been on the increase. We have so many countries that have adopted that concept of e-governance to facilitate the processes of public governance. Essentially, e-government entails the application of ICTs to facilitate the services of government. And a wide range of services, based on what we've seen, uh, can be supported ranging from being, I mean, people being able to pay their taxes online, renewal of motor vehicles, um, title deeds, registration, and all kinds of services. And actually taking a look at the global um, e-government development index. Of course, we have countries like Denmark, um, Estonia, Finland, Norway, Australia, really taking the lead globally. But also African countries have also been actually climbing up on that, on that index. And currently going by the uh, 2020 e-government index, we have countries like Mauritius, Seychelles and South Africa actually in the lead. And other African countries like Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana are also doing well on that scale. So generally we can say really that there's an increased awareness of e-government in Africa and governments are particularly interested in implementing more e-government solutions. However, there are still a lot of challenges that will actually cause this to scale, you know, at the level that is expected, and also ensuring that the level of participation in e-government also um, becomes wider. Because for now, it is still more of an elitist uh, concept in the sense that it is the section of the society that are well off, that are actually able to 
take advantage of these e-government uh, services and possibly also the middle class. So a major challenge, for example, is that quite a number of a large population of, Afri of Africans are still excluded from being able to actually enjoy e-government services. Of course, on the side of government, there are a lot of benefits in the sense that it makes the process of governance to be faster, efficiency is improved, productivity is enhanced, and also it has also done well to curb corruption in the sense that a lot of bureaucratic bottlenecks and all of that are removed and then people are actually, and government are actually able to focus on what matters. But in terms of the challenges, I think the major challenge has to do with availability of relevant ICT infrastructure. That is lacking in a lot of African countries and a lot of investments will be required to ensure that most African countries get to that level where the adoption of e-government can be more broad-based and participation can be increased. Also, there is also low level of literacy among employees in government. There is actually a low level of, of, of literacy. And these are things that have been corroborated by studies that have, been, uh, that have been carried out to actually see the state of, I mean, some of the limitations and challenges to heat government. Another issue that is also very important is the culture. There, is, there are also cultural challenges in terms of orientation of people, inertia to you know for change and all of those that also affects you know the adoption and the efficiency of e-government implementation but i think the major issue is the fact that in a lot of cases even where we have these e-government solutions there is a lack of sufficient participation of the citizens in this in the design of these e-government platforms right from the point of initiation monitoring and evaluation and if Africa really will really go forward in terms of increasing the division of e-government, then this actually needs to improve. The other thing also is the cost that is associated. Um, a lot of Africans have access to internet technology mainly through their mobile phones. So there is, there is lack of sufficient bandwidth, I mean, uh, broadband technology, you know, fiber and other um, alternatives apart from people using their data to be able to access e-government services. And if this is the case, then it means that they have to incur a lot of personal expenses to be able to do that, which also imposes a lot of limitations. So all of these things put together when addressed, I believe will help to advance Hi, um, I'm not sure if we lost Professor Daramola. Um, I think he was concluding quite well. Um, and I was about to tell him his time is up. Yeah, uh, I'm back now. Oh, you're back now. Okay, so <laughs> maybe that's another issue is the quality of service and bandwidth. Do you want to sum up briefly? Yeah, so yeah, just to sum up is to say that um, if we are to, if we will, I mean, for us to be able to increase the diffusion of e-government in Africa, some of these key challenges that have been mentioned in terms of ICT infrastructure, the cost of internet access, low literacy level of general low literacy level in ICT that is also prevalent among uh, public officials. All of these have to be addressed for us to actually move forward in terms of e-government in Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we were going to go to JD, um, who will have a complementary perspective on working with governments doing developing. But um, unfortunately, our, our panelist, um, uh, Mr. Snail, sees where Snail come to it. He has to go soon. So he will be providing an overview of um, possible or existing security and privacy challenges. Um, he'll speak in his personal capacity, but he has worked with the information regulator, which is still quite new in South Africa. And I think, and I'm talking now in very general and broad strokes, but um, often it may be thought that um, because at least in South African legislation, um, it, uh, uh, 
uh, e-government services are for the execution of, of a contract or um, for something that's necessary for government. Um, they're not um, regulated by data protection, but that's uh, that's not entirely correct. And privacy and security are still important. So, Sizwe, could you um, reflect on the challenges uh, with regards to security and privacy? Thank you very much, um, Alexis. It's, it's nice to uh, be here. And um, yeah, I just wanted to greet the other panelists as well. I think, I think the, the aspects regarding data protection and, and the synergy with cyber security is something that over the years we've really, really, um, we've, we haven't paid attention to it, you know, for a very, very long time. Africa was talking about getting its e-commerce laws in order. Then it was about getting our cybercrime um, legislation in order. But in that process, I think we forgot about data protection. I, I always say that um, data protection, um, as well as cybersecurity, they actually have a common denominator. And the common denominator um, is, is vulnerability, right? Vulnerability is dealt with in our data protection legislation um, with that section that talks about having technical and organizational measures to ensure the, 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 the confidentiality of the personal information that you are processing. And, and on the other hand, we have this development in our cybercrime legislation as well now with, with the new cybercrimes bill. Um, you know, the rest of Africa may, may seem as if it is tagging behind, but through the, the experiences that I've had um, in, in Africa, I've actually noticed that West Africa is very much developed in terms of data protection laws. Um, the, the, the Francophone speaking countries have really, really made an effort to get their data protection legislation in order. Um, as well as obviously the, the, the cyber criminal um, aspects. And, and same can be seen on, on, on the East African uh, plateau as well. So I think the, the, the issue now is, is to get everyone to, to understand the importance of data protection and the importance of cybersecurity and, and how that can, can help us in reducing cyber criminality. So I, I, I could go on and on, but my my slot is, is short, but basically what I want to say is I think Africa is no more in the dark ages. We're no more the dark continent. Even when you look out of space, you can actually see Africa light up now. Um, so I, I, I really think um, the, our legislators, our African countries have really done a good job to, to get in line with international trends and, and, and to really develop what I would call a African data protection norm and an and African uh, cybersecurity principles. Um, thank you very much. Super, Cesar. I'll let you go. Uh, we were meant to come up with policy recommendations. So it might yours be that we can develop an African data protection norm, uh, or would you like to drop another bullet point in there for a recommendation? Yeah, I think uh, an African data protection norm, very important, obviously based on internationally accepted principles. I'm, I'm, I'm really against copying and imitating other legislations, but let's accept it. Data protection is now an international uh, phenomenon. So what is good for us now as Africans is just to develop a data protection norm because our, our own African conventions don't all speak to, 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 to certain principles, um, such as privacy. So I think we should go beyond that and, 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 and now come up with a data protection norm. I'm very much aware of the Malambo Convention, um, which uh, Mohammed has just referred us to, but um, a little bit of a critique about the Malambo Convention is that I think it came 10 years too late. Hence, one now needs to really try and develop a further norm um, so that um, African data protection can be recognized as a legal 
acceptable amongst all African countries. So I think I'll thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and now, um, Felice, if you don't mind going uh, last, I think we'll jump to, to JD. Um, and JD, um, can you reflect on, um, uh, we didn't have someone from government, so if you um, could reflect on the, on the, the government side as well, but um, reflect on, on, be, on, on working uh, with governments uh, to, uh, as a developer, um, what are the challenges um, that arise uh, both in it, it, making these products and also obviously in the, the partnerships with, with government? Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so I'm speaking from particularly the perspective of, of two recent projects. Uh, one is Vileka Mali, um, the, the national um, open budget data portal in South Africa. Um, and that's more trying to just uh, disseminate information. And part of the project was also to uh, promote um, participatory budgeting, but that the technology can't solve that. That has to be a, a process change uh, that that takes longer than the, the, the project um, timeline to, to make. Um, and also a, a citizen engagement app uh, that we're building for a municipality. Um, and that's much more sort of accessing your services and, and a two-way interaction with uh, the public and, and government. And um, the so I think, and, and Open Up generally tries to work as much as a partner as, as you can when, when we are generally a, a service supplier to, to government, uh, but we work very closely. So I think the two main um, uh, blockages I would like to highlight, is, the one is that, uh, especially when there's the release of information, but actually when there's handling of any data, um, there's, there's a um, quite a, a big approval process that often has to happen, um, figuring out who's going to own the, the data, where the responsibilities lie, um, how are you going to ensure that data governance happens properly, to, to the, 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 the point of, of uh, Cizwe who just spoke. Um, and uh, that can be a big uh, stumbling block for making progress on a project. So in, in, in the software world, we use a, a process called agile, which is a bit of a buzzword, but really what it means is um, trying to work in small iterations and in each iteration, getting something out to the public so that people can actually start using stuff. And you as a project team can start learning what's working, what isn't working, what do people really need? Um, where should you be focusing your attention? And um, these long approval processes, you need quite a bit of information at hand to, to, to do the, that. You need to write the, the, the memo to, to say what information is going to be going where and be, will be kept where and who's going to be responsible for it. How are you going to ensure governance? And um, so you need a lot of information up front. Um, and, and there's a, a risk then that you kind of, you, you, you can't have that quick iteration of, of doing something basic and getting it out there. And I think I would um, propose that um, instead of sort of then going, well, we have this long approval process, let's do all of our research up front and then do all of our implementation once we have that approval to try and, and still do small experiments up front to, to, to do something basic, to kind of uh, have a mock process that you run with your end users. Um, where, where it's as much like uh, uh, the real process that you have in mind that you're trying to get approval for upfront. Then you start that approval process. And while that process is going, you can do another experiment for another aspect of your project. Um, so to, to try and have in parallel, have some of those sort of iterative processes. And as you get approval for the first one, get that out in a, in a real full implementation um, as quickly as you can so that you start getting that feedback and you can then roll that into your further development. I think the other thing I wanted to, um, to mention was in terms of uh, vendor lock-in. That's, that's a, a concern we find and, and a risk that we see. And um, I think one of the best um, sort of counter, counter um, approaches to vendor lock-in is, is using more open source. And there's a lot of hesitation from open source, um, whether it's secure, um, there's also a bit of um, the, the thinking that so some people say it's free. Open source is not free at all. You still have to pay people to install it, to configure it, um, and to, uh, to maintain it. 
the difference is you don't get stuck in these contract negotiation things or, or you, you're likely to get less stuck in sort of long, arduous contract negotiation uh, because there isn't just one vendor who can supply this for you or who can support this for you. The, the source code being out there means another software developer, another um, company is able to pick that up. And you can even use that as local skills development to, to promote uh, more skills that are, that are local um, and, and, have, um, and be, be less prone to vendor lock-in, uh, less prone to be uh, reliant on, on contracts with suppliers that are abroad. Super, I'll, I'll wrap up there. Okay, super. Have you got anything else to say? I didn't want to introduce you. We, uh, I will stop you. We're doing well for time. Um, so, and then we are going to solicit some recommendations here. But um, I think your one recommendation is to um, to, to do more experiments uh, and have mock processes, and then um, do this kind of in parallel with consultation with stakeholders. Um, um, and then, yeah, um, I think you also had a recommendation about um, vendor lock-in and using open source, which being a fan of open source, um, I liked. Um, so thanks very much if you want to um, sum those up, but we're going to iterate them at the end um, of the session. So uh, now we last have Felicia and then we're going to open the discussion. Um, I'm sure you all know Access now. Um, it's a uh, yeah, a human rights online advocacy organization, um, not just focusing exclusively on human rights, but and then they've had a big campaign um, since these shutdowns started on the continent uh, around 2018, 2017, if I recall correctly, called Keep It On. And um, Felicia is uh, with or leading the campaign. So Felicia, can you... Um, discuss the um, challenges uh, with regards to access in general and um, shutdowns in particular uh, when it comes to the delivery of e-government services. Thank you so much, um, Alexis. Um, and hi to all my full panelists. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be part of this panel today. And um, yeah, so briefly, Keep It On is a global campaign hosted up um, by Access Now. And the main objective, as Alex mentioned, is to fight internet shutdowns around the world. And um, this is really crucial because as many and many countries tend to um, tend towards um, e-government systems, it's really important for um, us to continue to advocate for barriers um, that disrupt or disrupt these processes. And um, particularly, we focus on ensuring that um, the digital rights of users at risk are respected around the world. And so um, since 2016, when the campaign was launched, uh, we continue to fight internet shutdowns through diverse um, strategies. And um, I would like to use, um, for instance, um, I would speak on our election assessment um, activities, for instance, to highlight how um, internet shutdowns interfere with people's um, rights as well as their access to um, important um, services across um, various countries. And so um, when we talk about e-government, that is making um, processes easier for people to access relevant um, services being provided by governments. And um, this kind of takes away the bottlenecks of bureaucracy as well as uh, um, bribery and corruption, hopefully. And so once the internet is shut down during um, important events like elections, like protests, like uh, global crisis, it further burdens people because they are not able to um, access the necessary or the already um, limited resources that they would have had access to. 
and I say limited because uh, most African countries are still in the process of um, digitalization as well as um, tending to use um, the internet in as at the center stage of most of its um, activities. And so um, it's really sad that um, Africa is on the list of um, most countries in Africa tend to shut down the internet um, during these important events. Um, and so just some highlights. In 2019, we did record 213 incidents of shutdowns and um, 25 of these incidents as compared to 17 in 2018 were recorded in Africa. And um, what makes the shutdowns in Africa really worrying is the fact that they tend to affect um, more people. That is to say that um, they are either nationwide or they cover several parts of the a particular country that disrupts um, internet access. And this definitely makes it difficult for people to access. Um, um, for instance, we are in a global pandemic and yet we did have some shutdowns happen in countries around elections. For instance, Tanzania did shut down the internet, did block access to uh, bulk SMS messages. And um, there was also the use of filtering of content, which meant that people will not be able to send some text messages or um, yeah, messages with some keywords and it's And this really, really affects people's participation in the election process. Um, because um, they will not be able to access information about the elections to inform their choices. They will not be able to um, hold their governments or their political parties accountable um, for promises or um, yeah, promises that they make during um, the election process. And um, one key thing also is the fact that um, during these shutdowns, we do have incidents of human rights abuses against people um, and the shutdowns enable states and non-state actors to be able to cover these up because um, it's difficult for journalists, for human rights defenders to um, get into the country to access information and to report to the rest of the world about um, what's happening. And so in conclusion, I would say that it's important for governments in Africa to invest more in, in, in the power of the internet to ensure that more and more people come online rather than adapt um, measures like internet shutdowns or censorships or even introduction of certain legislations that are really, really repressive and backward um, in the in our struggle towards ensuring that everyone has access to the internet to enable them um, enjoy the relevant rights that are important to them, as well as participate actively in national discourse and um, in governance. Super, thanks Felicia. Um, I think we've had uh, a good um, broad uh, a range of I wouldn't say perspectives because we're going to see where your perspectives are aligned now, but we've had a broad range of the issue areas um, and, and the fields that one must deal with. So I'm going to collect questions um, from the audience um, and uh, briefly check the Twitter. So we've had one question to begin with um, from Mohammed uh, Timuli. Timulali, sorry, um, and he's asking about lessons uh, from the COVID uh, COVID nineteen pandemic um, and um, e government services. Um, so, uh, do we have any lessons learned, or any policy recommendations, or things to look out for in the future? I'd say lessons learned. We're still in the middle of the pandemic. Would be question one. Um, and then um, we have um, uh, question two from, from JD. Um, so do government, I would guess Felicia can answer that, although um, others can. Do governments respond um, to being named and shamed internationally for blocking internet access? Um, 
And then the third question I would like to ask, because we at Research ICT Africa were interested in this um, specifically with regards to contact tracing earlier, uh, but should e-government services be zero rated? And zero rating is when ISPs, usually mobile operators, um, through usually some sort of an agreement uh, with um, either governments or companies agree to share certain content without charging for the data. So we have three questions, um, and if, if all of the panelists could speak uh, briefly to that, and then I'll get, gather some more questions. That's COVID-19, the naming and the shaming, and the zero rating. So we'll start with Professor Daramola. Okay. Um... In terms of um, lessons from COVID-19, I think the major lesson uh, that one could pick is the fact that um, also drawing from, I mean, reports that, that, um, that I mean, reports of, of, of things that has happened all over the world. For example, in countries where the e-government uh, infrastructure has been so well developed, the advent of COVID-19 has actually emphasized the importance of he government in those countries. Countries like Denmark, Norway, Estonia, that, I mean, that are very high in the e-government index have been able to cope well with some of the demands of their citizens despite COVID. Unlike instances where, particularly in Africa, where a lot of activities um, could not take place because of the restrictions. So I think the major lessons here, for example, is that um, if African countries will invest more in developing their e-government infrastructure to enable e-government services, then situations like COVID will not really have an adverse impact. I mean, for example, if you look at South Africa here, um, a lot of people could not renew their vehicle, you know, the, the vehicle permit and all of that because people cannot go out and a um, very limited number could actually, process, could actually be processed electronically. The same thing also with all the other forms of, I mean, all the other types of services because some of these services are still um, orientated to the manual approach. So the more, I mean, the, the, the more African countries are able to invest in e-government services, I think the better of who, I mean, will be for everyone. Thank you. Good. Thanks very much. Um, I believe Siswe is not here. Um, so if we can move to JD. Thank you. Um, I think what was really interesting with COVID-19 was um, how quickly uh, the local government that we're working with uh, for their um, engagement app um, could respond. And I think largely using Facebook and, um, and WhatsApp um, to, to still have some degree of public participation for their uh, legislated uh, participatory planning process for their IDP process. Um, what was interesting, there, there were two things I think that highlighted some, some problems. The one is that there's often a perspective that uh, a government entity's website is a, a, um, a legislated thing, it's a prescribed thing, it's, it's not actually seen as something that uh, the public would, would be using. They just feel like it, they have to check a box for someone. Um, and that shines through when, when the information isn't organized in an accessible way and when events aren't published and it's not sort of treated as the go-to place to find out when there's an event happening, when that's actually precisely what uh, a government entity's website is good for. Um, I think that uh, that, that was the, the one thing where it, it needed some, some quick thinking to arrange the content in a way that is accessible. Um, the other thing was the, uh, that this municipality is fantastic at providing uh, free Wi-Fi access, but they switched it off because uh, people were sort of coming together um, and at risk of infecting one another. And that's tragic because at the time when people most needed internet access to be able to, to use services online that they couldn't use in, uh, in person, 
um, the, the internet access that, that they relied on was taken away. Um, so that, that was quite, um, quite a, an interesting and a, and a complicated point, I think. Um, and I think the, the reason I asked the question about um, uh, governments responding to being named and shamed is, is that something that's often used in, um, in budget transparency to say, uh, look at how transparent these other governments are, these other parts of government, maybe these municipalities are, are sharing their information, why aren't you? Um, and and it, in certain cases, I think it does work, work quite effectively. Um, yeah, I don't remember the, the last question. <laughs> Okay, super. Um, yeah, the, the last question was actually yours about um, uh, about uh, naming and shaming. Yeah, yeah. But that's that will go to Felicia because that's um, <laughs> I think Felicia is very well posed to reflect on that. So, um, and Felicia, you might also obviously want to comment on the COVID nineteen um, question as well because you would have a hopefully a, a little bit of a different human rights angle. So Felicia, can we move to you now? Um, thank you. Um, with regards to COVID, um, definitely um, we did record incidents. Or, so under the Keep It On campaign, we have a project called the Shutdown Story Projects. And this is um, a project that we use to highlight the impact of shutdowns on people's lives. And so we did um, receive stories from around the world um, with regards to COVID. Um, in India, for instance, there were reports from medical officers and um, um, frontline workers about how the shutdown in Jammu and Kashmir was impacting their work because they were not able to access um, um, information being rolled out by the WHO, and this really would have an impact on how they are able to provide medical support to uh, people in times of this pandemic. And there was, we did also receive um, stories from the tribal um, districts in Pakistan, where students were not able to access education for the period of um, the shutdown which I think is still ongoing. And um, this would definitely impact their education as compared to their colleagues that are in other parts of the country where education has been moved online and um, people, uh, and they would not be able to access education. And then also one area was um, the refugee camps in Bangladesh, in Cox's Bazaar refugee camp where refugees were not able to access information and even um, humanitarian services um, groups did um, complain that the shutdown was impacting their delivery of services to um, the, the refugees in these areas. So these are just some of the highlights of the impacts of um, disruptions during COVID-19. And then with regards to um, the last question from JD, um, definitely, we do have the uh, annual reports, that is the Internet Shutdowns Report, where we highlight cases of shutdowns that happen over the year. And we, did, we do name governments that disrupt um, these internet services. And what we also do is that we share this report with um, diverse stakeholders to um, bring to their attention these shutdowns and their impacts and um, call on them to condemn governments that resort to these um, measures. And for instance, um, in the last, the most recent example I can give is um, that um, during the shutdowns in Belarus, um, some 29 um, countries, including the US, including some European um, allies did denounce what was happening in the country. And so these are positive steps that um, we can um, rely on and push for so that um, when governments are named and shamed, they would um, stop um, disrupting internet access. And one thing that we would want to see is that, um, for instance, election observer groups 
should include internet shutdowns as an indicator in um, their um, documents um, in monitoring um, elections that's fair or free to ensure that governments are consciously working towards keeping the internet on rather than disrupting it um, during election processes, which really has um, devastating impact on the outcome of most elections that we've seen around the globe. Super, um, thanks very much. I'm currently canvassing the audience for the second round of questions. Um, I'm not sure if we direct, uh, address directly the zero rating question, so panelists can pick that up if they want to. Um, I have a framing question that I'm interested in, but um, at Research ICT Africa, we've observed what's called the digital inequality paradox. So as we get these, these waves of what are considered at the time new ICTs or new technologies, uh, more people do get access to the internet, um, but then inequalities uh, digitally and how they are reflected in real life um, can also be enhanced. So now, you know, we're at the age of the fourth industrial industrial revolution and working from home. And so that 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 um, creates a lot of benefits for many, but it also creates uh, yeah, uh, it, it also creates uh, people who who lose out. So um, are e government services uh, creating uh, more digital inequalities? And how are they also enhancing existing societal biases so you know how you measure and relate with your citizens can have um, biases in them and for example like in india the adha id um, has also been used in certain incidences to um, exclude people who um, from government services um, and also um, to get an adha id i believe you also um, have to prove if you're from a refugee background that you've been uh, in India for a certain amount of time or a generation. Um, and that's quite hard to prove for the people who've been involved and in internally displaced peoples from the conflicts up in the north uh, last with, with Bangladesh. So yeah, how are um, digital inequalities being affected by the rollout of government services is my question. Um, I don't have any other questions for the audience, um, but we were also interested in the language issue. So most African countries are multilingual. Um, I think in South Africa, uh, where we have 11 official languages, that's actually a, a very small amount of languages, although we're able to have 11 official languages. We don't have, uh, like in, for example, the Democratic Repub Republic of Congo and Nigeria between 200 and 400 languages. So um, how are languages being addressed? And I'll go to um, Prof. Daramola first. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, in terms of um, e-government services promoting or helping to bridge the gap in terms of inequality, I will say that for now, the major form of uh, inequality comes in terms of the socioeconomic status of people because e-government services are being provided, but are more, they are more accessible to people that belong to the higher income bracket in terms of having access to internet collectivity I mean, particularly in a lot of African countries, there is also power. I mean, there's also issues of uh, even availability of power supply, electricity. You know, most times government is not able to provide this effectively. People need to fall back on their own resources, you know, to make to, to actually provide alternative power supply. So all of these things are things that could be afforded by people that have higher income compared to the low income HANA. So in terms of, so really, so the issue of poverty, the issue of lack of access to economic resources um, creates that kind of divide in the sense that for now, e-government services are more accessible for people that have 
higher income compared to the low income earners. And something needs to be done along these lines. A lot of people still rely on basically their mobile phones to be able to access the internet. So that is why the notion of, for example, having uh, zero rated website, for example, some of these uh, e-government website could actually be zero rated and that could actually increase the rate at which people are able to gain access and also make use of the services that have been provided on these websites. Now, in terms of uh, talking about um, uh, having multilingual e-government websites, that is not yet commonplace in Africa. Most of the implementations are basically, uh, they are based on usually maybe what is termed the lingua franca of the country. So if it is, if the, if the official language is English, then it's English. If it's official language is French, then it's French or Portuguese. The, 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 we, we are not yet having instances where we have e-government services, um, I mean, websites, for example, being able to support indigenous languages. And this is one aspect that should be looked into because that could also, pro I mean, that could also promote accessibility in terms of how people are actually able to access these websites. And even if that cannot be done, uh, for example, looking at the Nigerian example, of course, there are so many uh, languages over 250 and all of that, but Pidgin English, for example, happens to be a language or something that is widely spoken. So having a government website, for example, in Pidgin, it's something that will actually strike a chord you know, with a lot of people, because some of our people are able to converse using pidgin or adulterated English and all of that. So having a website, you know, like that, for example, would be something that will resonate with a lot of people. So these are some of the perspectives that should be explored to ensure that e-government diffusion is increased in Africa generally. Thank you. Uh, super. Um, could we move to JD? Thank you. I think um, the 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 move to so, sort of the the increasing inequalities is definitely a risk uh, when when you're digitizing services, and I think it's very related to the the problem we see with um, with industrialization, mechanization, and another fourth industrial revolution of of um, people losing jobs because uh, things are becoming uh, digitized and you don't need as many people to, uh, to, do that, to, uh, to do that work. And I think as a society, we shouldn't see the, the gains of, um, of automation go to, uh, to making money. They should first go to going, well, we, there's less labor now to kind of do the thing that we're doing a lot. So let's put that, that excess uh, labor to providing a better service for the people we couldn't serve, serve as well before. Um, so if, if your administration is now a lot more efficient because the, the typical tasks people do um, are, are now, now quick and online for the most part, then you've got all of these people available who can now actually help those people with, with questions that fall slightly outside the box. Um, I th think that's the approach we should take with, um, with uh with our labor force but also with with providing government services uh, rather than than at the first opportunity firing everyone because now we've got a computer doing the job um and and there's the the principle of a a, a Pareto improvement like if we're bringing a, an improvement to our processes um are we it's not really an improvement if we're actually uh disadvantaging a whole bunch of people so we should be seeing can we bring in an improvement um, that that is maybe improving it for some, but it doesn't make it worse for for anyone. Um, and I think the same principle can be applied to to the language thing. I think it, it, uh, speaking someone's native language or 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 something close to to what what they understand and not just using English all over the place, um, I think is really important. But um, a lot of government work, uh, processes, bureaucracy happens at such a, a high, uh, like domain specific technical language um, that the people who are working in those processes understand, but the general public does not understand that 
it's so important to use language that people can actually relate to. Um, I'm always using examples from, from budgeting and, and uh, fiscal transparency because that's where my, most of my work is, but using things like uh, planned spending instead of the word budget, because a lot of people don't really relate to the word budget. Um, using spending instead of expenditure. Um, and I think we should be careful if we're translating services into other languages that or we should be aware that um, you're going to have to repeat the task of using uh, accessible language um, and, and not just translating it into something that no one uses day to day and no one is actually familiar with and able to, to um, interact with. Super, I think that's an excellent point. Um, in this age of AI and the fourth industrial revolution, we tend to focus on like getting the latest and greatest and uh, kind of romanticize stuff that sounds very technical. And we focus so much on the software, not on the people where. So um, I'm not saying that everyone's job is going to be protected and we can just invest more in people. But um, yeah, I mean, I think you made an excellent point to have people running these systems. And at least in e-government, um, this is a chance um, to, uh, yeah, to, to, have better delivery of services um, and more of a human connection. Could we move now to um, Felicia? Okay, Felicia has lost connection. So if you can move to the desk. Okay, super. Um, I have no more questions from the audience, do I? Uh, we've prepared some questions which we've um, addressed. Um, I think we wanted to talk about procurement, which um, we've kind of uh, dealt with indirectly, but uh, there's great pressure from, from vendors to, uh, for people to adopt the latest and greatest and more expensive technologies, uh, whereas it's not necessarily needed. Um, also in South Africa, this vendor push has also resulted in, in lots of um, money being wasted on corruption as well, and the big vendors being involved in that. Um, we're interested in interoperability. I think this is where maybe open source uh, clocks in. Um, and then also innovation. People also always talk about how we foster innovation. Um, how is innovation different when it comes to e-government services um, rather than startups? Um, uh, how does it look in the public sector? And is it something that we actually need? So, um, Unless Felicia has popped back, uh, could we try address those questions? And then I think we got your policy recommendations quite nicely recorded. But if if each of the speakers want to restate them in bullet point format or add a new policy recommendation, uh, Prof. Daramola. Well, um, in terms of the issue of interoperability, interoperability, I think it's it's very very important, um, particularly when we are talking about the need for um, integration and interaction among different uh, arms of government, because one of the things that uh, could be very um, let me say offensive to citizens, for example, is if people have to repeat, uh, maybe for example, somebody needs to, you know, repeat, you know, giving certain information on different, I mean, different, different uh, government platforms, whereas some of this information could actually, could have been ported, you know, one way or the other, so that, you know, a lot of time could be saved and all of that. And then also the need also to ensure that information are shared, you know, um, I mean, across different government platforms. So that is really, um, that is really um, a very important thing to consider. But for now, um, we do not have that as much as it should be. Yeah, maybe for different reasons. Uh, if I give an example um, of Nigeria, for example, a lot of a lot of state governments or what is equivalent to maybe provinces. I mean, if I compare with South Africa, for example, have e-government websites and all that. But there is actually no platform for any form of information exchange. And yet you may have citizens that have 
concerns that are cross-cutting. I mean, somebody is having certain things to do with one particular state and it's also possible he has some other things with another state. And so really there's actually no platform for that. So that is really something to, to, to look at. I would say that for now, we can say that um, in terms of the level of advancement or sophistication of e-government in Africa, maybe we are just at the first level. And as we progress, more sophistication and advancement will come in that will make you know issues of interoperability uh, something that is actually more prominent. So I want to stop there. Okay, super. Um, JD, I think you are the last remaining panelist that's online. Um, and yeah, if you could uh, speak to those three questions. Thank you. Yeah, th th thankfully my internet connection held up. Um, I think the there's a cultural change I think we need to see in terms of procurement um, that maybe isn't quite to, to the question, but um, there's there's a, a notion that a lot of this information can be uh, is 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 commercially sensitive and um, it's it's really taken too far. Um, the um, it, it, as soon as you choose to participate in, in a government project, you should expect your, uh, your, your contract details to be public. Um, and we saw that very quickly with, with COVID-19 when the, the uh, president of South Africa proclaimed that the, the COVID-19 expenditure um, has to be public. Uh, what, what services and um, goods were uh, ordered from which suppliers for how much money? And suddenly it's that simple. This information could become public while it's normally a, a massive hassle to get access to that information. Um, so to that, we uh, at Open Up uh, with uh, PSAM uh, built a website uh, at uh, keeptherecipes.org.za uh, to show that information and make it easily accessible because they, they, they publish this information, but as PDF, so it's, um, it's really hard to kind of um, sort of cut across and, and look for, for value for money and do value for money assessment and, um, and see whether, we're, uh, where, whether any part of government is being exploited when there's much better deals being cut somewhere else. And I think that speaks to two, two issues for me. The one is that uh, I think there's value in, um, in uh, governance uh, and different entities in government having some independence and just being able to run and do their job without interference from some central uh, point all the time. But uh, the decentralization of that information is very frustrating to, to public governance. The other thing is that um, the, a lot of the, the work on, on procurement is around government trying to make uh, rules and, and systems to make procurement fair and effective and, and uh, value for money. Um, and not thinking that um, there, there, there really must be an element of public participation there, uh, public oversight, and not realizing what enormous value there will be from public oversight in procurement. Um, so, so that's, I think, a big concern for me and, and a cultural change that we need to see that fundamental to, uh, to fair and uh, value for money procurement is, um, is transparency and uh, public oversight of this, of this process. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Super, thank you so much for joining the session. Um, I think we've had a good wrap up. Uh, we'll be feeding the uh, main recommendations through to the session after the main session. Um, so we'll make sure that everything is reported. Um, I'd like to thank everyone involved, to thank all the speakers for making time. Um, I'd also like to thank Senka. She's been uh, quiet um, doing her rapporteuring, but um, this was uh, mainly um, Senka's baby in terms of the conceptualization of the session. And I believe that Senka is doing research on e-government services, so she, um, will probably be following up with the panelists um, for some networking after this. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, hi, Alex. Hi. Uh, before we go, I wanted to take a group photo, so if you can on, we can turn on our video so that we can take okay. a photo.
What a good idea. All right, that's great. Uh, so please, everyone. Everybody say ICTs. <laughs> E government. Are we ready? Yeah. All right. Say cheese. Cheese. <laughs> All right, good. We're good. We're good. All right. Okay, super. Thank you so much. And thanks for the um, organization. Uh, is that Joshua there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's Joshua. Just a second. Okay. So, the, the, the person who took the photo wasn't me, that was Francis. Okay, okay, super. Um, Thank you. I've also taken a photo. Okay. Um, bye bye, everyone. I guess this room is being used for the next session. Is that correct? So, or... Yes, actually. Okay, super. So, um, uh, I can I stay or should I rejoin as a attendee? Well, you need to join. It's a different link. So, depending on what you're attending to. Okay, super. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of the African IGF. Thank you. Bye. Bye.